Senator Jason Barrett, our first guest. Good morning, JB. Good morning. You got some love yesterday. Uh, Katie Spriggs uh, was on the program from Epic, and uh, she mentioned your help in getting some bills passed. And I know there's another one uh, specifically you wanted to talk about today that she touched on yesterday, which is uh, an exemption uh, that uh, you guys are working on removing from some of the laws regarding marriage and rape. Yeah, and actually the House um, had a bill last, I believe, Friday uh, that they amended on the floor that removed the um, marriage exemption uh, for rape. And it is a bill that's introduced uh, in the Senate as well uh, that I hope uh, gets some traction for. So West Virginia is an outlier in, in a negative way, I think, in the fact that um, you, know, you cannot be charged with rape if you're uh, married to the individual. So um, why that's on the books, I don't know, but I'm, I'm sure it's something for a very long time ago. And, um, you know, I think most of us in the Senate do support that. I think most of us in the legislature support removing this exemption. Uh, but I think we need to send a very clear message uh, in West Virginia that um, uh, rape is never acceptable. So was this brought uh, up? That that, go ahead. Was this ever brought up before when you were in the House, Jason, in your earlier years as a delegate? I don't remember in the House, no. Uh, I, it, it was a, I know there was some discussion um, in the Senate last year about it, uh, but for whatever reason, if we just ran out of time, it was a bill that's been in judiciary. So this, as you know, it's my first year in judiciary. So I, I couldn't tell you the specifics as to why the bill um, you know, didn't run last year, but I'm, I'm hopeful that, that it will this year. Jason, uh, is there, uh, anything besides rape, is spousal abuse also included? Well, any type of abuse is already, um, you know, any type of physical abuse is, with the exception of rape, is always uh, illegal. But, but this just says that this just adds, it removes the exemption for marriage uh, as it relates to rape. So some of the things I think, and that's some of the folks that I, that I believe may have, uh, that may not want to be supportive of the bill is to say that, you know, if there's any violence involved, then that's already illegal. Well. Um, it's possible that balance would not be involved. So um, I, I wouldn't want to come back to voters and say I voted against that. Um, I think that sends the wrong message to women. I think it sends the wrong message to the people of West Virginia. I think it sends the wrong message to the rest of the world. And Jason, you sat on the EPIC board for a while. Are you still involved with them or have you, um, have you gone off that board? Um, I was on that board, Maria, I think for nearly 10 years, or maybe it was over 10 years. And I, I knew it was the a president long time. for a couple of years. And one of the things that, that we did during my tenure was implement term limits. So uh, I'm no longer there. On you the board. go. I, I, I termed out. But uh, they uh, have done a lot of great work over the years with, uh, as, as most people know, that they, the, the name was the Shenandoah Women's Center. and. I think during my, my time on the board, I know we changed. I don't know if I was the president. I think I may have been the president when we changed uh, from the Shenandoah Women's Center to the Eastern Panhandle Empowerment Center. Uh, and they do tremendous work with um, providing uh, shelter for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, uh, as well as uh, counseling and, and legal aid and uh, legal advocacy, I should say. And so the, the organization does a lot of great work, and, and they're to be commended for it. Jason, uh, I presume that uh, if rape is an allegation during marriage, it just defaults to what would be a standard criminal investigation of a rape accusation, uh, even though it's a, it's a marriage, obviously, and this was exempted uh, or still is until this law is passed. Uh, I see some comments in our Facebook section that say something to the effect that in the past the argument was, what if my wife gets mad at me and says that I raped her? Uh, divorces can get pretty ugly. Uh, there can be all sorts of accusations during a divorce. So can I be safe in assuming that that's what ends up happening in this scenario? Well, I mean, I think that um, you know, people can get mad at, at boyfriends and girlfriends and um, or, or whatever, what any other title that they may have in a relationship and, and do the exact same thing. Um, so I don't, I don't know that that argument holds a lot of water, but... Um, you know, I think you know you, you can envision a scenario where, you know, maybe the couple is separated. One of them is living upstairs and downstairs, and um, where they're completely separate, and and you know, there's a rape involved in a scenario like that. And and you know, I, just because someone 
may have the ability to get mad at someone and make a false accusation, that doesn't mean that the, the act should be illegal. Um, so Agreed. Uh, the, uh, I think on the House side, they're calling this the Delta House bill. This is uh, the one uh, Mike Height was behind in regards to trying to get uh, counties the ability to enact impact fees even if they don't have zoning. I know that had some momentum in the House. How's it look in the Senate? Uh, it is on, I think it's on third reading today in the Senate. Maybe it's on second reading. Um, we, I mean, the, the bill's passed out of committee already. Uh, it's on the Senate floor, and I believe it is on third reading today. What are your thoughts on this bill, personally? Well, well, I, I mean, you know, I think that you're either going to land on two sides. Either you think that with all the growth that comes into counties, that the growth should pay for the growth, or you think that um, when all the growth comes in and all the necessary infrastructure that needs to be added, that everyone uh, across the county pay for it. And so, you know, I think that that most people in Berkeley County agree that the growth should pay for growth. Somebody comes in and they put up a 300 um, house subdivision and there's extra infrastructure that needs to be run there. There's obviously an impact on the community and, and, and with, with all types of infrastructure. And, and I think most people would believe that, that there should be uh, some additional uh, revenue uh, paid by the, uh, or fees paid by the developer and the folks you know, that, are, that are buying those, those homes, as opposed to uh, the seniors or folks on a fixed income or, or families that have you know, been here for 40 or 50 years and have continued to, to pay rates. So, you know, I think the option is to, to just raise the rates and, and fees on everybody that, that's already here and has a home or, you know, the folks that are going to require the additional infrastructure or in their additional infrastructure in the community because we're getting so many large subdivisions. You know, I think that, that, that most people would say that the growth should pay for growth. Uh, Jason, two questions. Uh, question number one is: uh, Is w- any restrictions uh, being applied to how these monies be used, or is it going to be totally at the discretion of the county council? County well, council. It, it's whatever the law is now, and and the, 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 there are some guidelines as to uh, how the money um, uh, or, or or the criteria in which you have to to meet to be able to impose these impact fees. And I want to make one thing very clear is that the bill does only one thing. The bill only says that you, the county no longer has to have countywide zoning in order to implement impact fees. There are four counties in this state that have countywide zoning. They can implement these impact fees already. Um, one of the list of seven or eight different criteria says that you have to have zoning. And the, and the only thing this bill does is strike that requirement. Okay, and the second question is, uh, would a county still be able to use the uh, facilities improvement fees, such as what the ward and sewer does, uh, in addition to impact, or are they going to preclude having both of them? Well, as the bill is written now, um, the, the, it, the capacity improvement fee that you're talking about yeah. would not be um, touched under this piece of legislation. This only deals with impact fees. Jason, if uh, counties were able to enact impact fees, would they be universal county to county, or would it be up to each individual county commission or council to determine what would be subject to those? Again, the, the same way it is now, and and now the the counties have the ability to implement their own um, their own plan. Uh, there, again, there is a list. Of, I wish I had them in front of me, but there are a list of seven or eight things that these counties have to do. One of one of the things that that I think is is most important to understand is that the counties cannot just institute an impact fee because they want to. They have to demonstrate the growth or the potential growth um, that is coming. So to qualify right now, you have to sustain a, a, at least a 1% average in increase in population for five straight years. Or you have to be able to show that your uh, increased population over the next five years meets the same standard. And, there are not many counties across the state, as you know, uh, they're getting where near close to that. I think mm-hmm. um, if, you, if you looked at the counties right now that did not have zoning and maintain that at least 1% average growth for five consecutive years, I would say there's probably only two, maybe three counties in the entire state, clearly Berkeley being one of them. Maria? So 
Um, just changing gears a little bit, Jason, talk a mm-hmm. little bit about the discipline bill. Uh, so the, the Senate had one opponent, one opposing vote, Senator Trump, um, won't ask you why he voted um, to, not, uh, to not favor that bill. But in the, in the journal yesterday, um, there was a story and um, a gentleman uh, at the end of the story, the, the Reverend Matthew Watts was talking about, uh, it sounded like he was alluding to the fact that there was an overreach in this bill. How do you respond to that? Um, if you want to give a little, um, a little synopsis of the bill, and then if you consider there to be any overreach. Well, I, I would say that I don't think there's any overreach. I, I think that, um, well, I, I know that one of the biggest uh, complaints and feedback that we get from educators, and there was um, a, a survey done, uh, well, one by the WVEA, one of the teachers unions, but also um, the state senate um, partnering with the Department of Education uh, was able to send out a survey as well. and. The, the 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 thing that I think that was the most popular uh, among uh, or, or what got the the most attention and and, and what um, the feedback that the teachers uh, gave to us uh, their biggest concern and the biggest impediment to doing their job and the thing that um, you know is is the, the the most stressful for them I guess for lack of a better word is the fact that. Um, the discipline, there's, there's very little discipline within our schools, that there are a lot of uh, children that unfortunately um, uh, exhibit extremely bad behavior and, and impede the, the progress of other students. And I don't think that they feel that they're backed up by administration as much as they should. So this clearly um, sets guidelines and, and protocols for if these students are in um, you know, or, or have an extreme behavioral uh, issue, which is deemed violent, um, and um, you know it sets up a uh, behavioral intervention program. Uh, I think there are only 21 counties with that behavioral intervention program. I think this bill will, will likely encourage more counties to do that. Uh, but if a county doesn't have that program, then they're going to have to partner with a county that does and get these students and these children in the right environment. Um, to get them on the right path, um, but while doing that, not to impede the progress and the education of, of the other students. Jason, it's basically a removal from the classroom bill, is it not? If some, if some student is disruptive, they move from the classroom for a period of time, come back to the classroom a longer period of time, they continue to be disruptive. disruptive. Yeah, uh, it, and, and I want to make sure it, this isn't just some – kid clowning around and throwing a paper airplane across the room. I mean, that's not what this is about. This is about children that, that are violent, that um, you know, may pick a chair up and throw it across the room or have outbursts or, or you know, physically touch the other students or the teacher or, or really become violent in nature. And, and, and in some cases, we've heard from teachers where they send them to the principal's office, the principal gives them a lecture, they send them back either later that day or the next day, and the principal comes in, sits in the classroom, and watches little Johnny be an angel. Uh, as soon as the principal leaves, then he's back to, um, you know, back to being violent and disruptive, and, and uh, again, um, you know, prohibits the other students there from learning. And um, so it is a the bill does you know require um, in in these circumstances that the child be removed, the student be removed from the classroom. Uh, there's a uh, has to be an evaluation by someone trained and, and licensed to be able to, to to make mental evaluations and and really just help these students uh, get on the right track. But the uh, the discipline in, uh, implies a fairly large spectrum of actions that could be taken. But I think in this particular bill, the only action is removal and evaluation. Is that correct? Uh, Yes, and I I didn't serve on the edu- I don't serve on the education committee, and I have read the bill, and but I didn't get to hear all the debate and discussion on the education committee. But as I read it, uh, I believe that's right. Okay. And this is the focus, Jason, is elementary school because last year the 
um, the upper grades, six to twelve, were um, were handled in a in an alternative mm -hmm. bill. Correct. That's right. Okay. How is your county commission bill proceeding in regards to replacing commissioners, Jason? Uh, we sent that over to the house, and to be honest with you, I haven't seen what committee or committees. I hope not, but uh, which committee that bill got referred to. So I, I haven't heard any opposition, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, um, we passed it out of the House the other day, uh, Monday, I believe, um, unanimously, and uh, passed it out of the Senate, I'm sorry, old habit. Mm -hmm. uh, passed it out of the Senate unanimously the other day, and it, it's over to the House now. So, um, you know, I'll be talking with some of my colleagues over there to, to help ensure that we can get the bill on the agenda and, and move and get it passed so that um, there is a clear process for those counties with uh, five commissioners that in the event that there is a vacancy and in the event that um, the four remaining commissioners cannot come to an agreement on who the replacement should be, that there's a very clear process moving forward. Jason, going back very quickly to the uh, dis uh, school discipline bill, sure. and uh, is there any monies that have been provided to, uh, uh, to accommodate or help accommodate any action taken? That was a, a that's a good question, Bill, and that was a question that was asked um, by Senator Wolfel from Cabell County to the Education Chair, Senator Grady, um, and and she said that you know that there really wasn't a requirement that she thought at this time uh, for additional funds to be able to implement this. That that the schools you know have the resources to be able to do this. It's just a matter of you know I think ensuring that the administration knows what the protocols are and what what this policy is and, and it needs to be implemented. Um, I, I think it's more of really just the teachers knowing that someone has their back and and, and she and she's a school teacher. So, you know, I, she's a fourth grade teacher, actually. So mm -hmm. this is what she deals with, you know, I believe to be on a daily basis. So um, at this point, she indicated that there wasn't additional funds needed. Do you have to run to your uh, Senate caucus meeting now, Jason? I got two minutes. What do you got? I think, uh, go ahead, Bill. You have one no, I was going to say there's a uh, program such as this uh, in Berkeley County uh, that does require some dollars to operate. I think right now it's coming out of the, the school budget. Uh, but if this becomes, if it develops the way I think it probably should, I would hope there'd be some dollars uh, directed toward the program. Yeah, yeah, and I would agree. And if, you know, if, if we come back next year and, and schools say there's additional money, and I'm, I believe, I'm quite certain that, that Berkeley County is one of them with the behavioral intervention program. So I think that's, that's probably what you're talking about. Bill. Yes, it is. Yes. Jason, thank you kindly. Always a pleasure. <laughs> you guys have a good day. Have a thank good you. Jason. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, you too. And by the way, Summer Barrett in our comment section made mention of the fact that the Delta House bill was not the one uh, that I was referring it had to do with uh, uh, election primary, I guess, moving election days. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in regards to school discipline, I, I never understood this this aspect of it. So there are certain kids who just don't want to be in a classroom, and it's for a variety of reasons. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily bad kids, although you know some of them have some serious problems. Uh, some of them just can't sit still and don't want to be in a classroom. But for them, that's just not a conducive way to learn, right? And I had a, my oldest son was probably that way. The classroom was probably the worst place for him to try to learn something because he couldn't sit still, right? Uh, but in regards to serious discipline issues, it, it seems to me that those kids don't want to be in school. So you reward them when you suspend them out of school. And where do they go? Are they just going home they, or to an well, alternative? They're supposed to go. Uh, most of them just go home. Okay. Which is exactly what they wanted in the first place. Right. So why reward that? The suspension, school suspension should be in school suspensions. Mm -hmm. And if that means we've got to divert some money or create some new money to, ha to have it served that way, then that's the way it should be. I don't see it making sense, at least not common sense, to reward bad behavior by saying, yeah, stay home for another week. Right? Right. Agreed. I, I don't see that as being a productive way to discipline somebody. But the, the approach that Berkeley County is taking would avoid that. They would Correct. move into a different type of environment, a more controlled but it, but environment. But as Jason said, there's only 20-something counties in the state yeah. that implement that right now. So that needs to grow because, to reiterate, it makes no sense to reward somebody for misbehaving by saying, yes, they'll sleep in for a couple more days. Exactly. Right? 
Uh, Doug Scaff is going to be our next guest, and uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, but Senator Joe Manchin will be joining us after the 9 o'clock break. You two know that, of course, because I send you the guest list. And I know a few questions are out there as to what his future plans are regarding the presidency. A lot of questions. Every time he's interviewed by regardless of who, that's a question that's asked. What mm-hmm. are your plans? And the related question is, what's going to happen with the Unity Party or the No Labels Party? He's, his name has been linked with that very, very closely. Earlier, you don't see his name linked with it so much now. So I'd be curious to see if that pro, if that party is still going to be moving forward and if Senator Manchin is going to be parallel to that or run something individual, so something totally different, or just stay out of the race altogether. I can't believe he's going to stay out of the race. Uh, it's he's, hard. I, yeah. he He's one of those guys who didn't sit still in the classroom, I think. Mm-hmm. I think, if I had to make a prediction on that. And it's just hard to believe for as much in the limelight as he has been – that he completely steps back and I don't want to say does nothing, but spends time with family because mm-hmm. that's what everybody does when they tell your family gets sick yeah. of you and yes. says, go find something to do. <laughs> and, and I, and I agree, Maria, but I think in Senator Manchin's case, there's something even in addition to that. And that, I believe he genuinely is concerned about this country. He's concerned about the polarization. He would like to be in a position to try to, to fix this polarization, to mend what we have. And I think this is one of the drivers of any, any action he takes. Well, Thank if you. ever there was a time for a third-party candidate, and this yeah. seems to kind of it would be now. emerge every 20 or 30 years, this would seem to be the time. And I was uh, listening to a poll this morning driving in uh, on the way to work, and it was talking about the dissatisfaction within the Democratic Party itself of Joe Biden, mm-hmm. and then a national poll which cited that more people are concerned about uh, President Biden's age than even Donald Trump's age. Trump is 77, I believe, Biden 81, he'd be 82 at the start of a next presidency. And there are people who have very legitimate concerns about that. And somebody yesterday, and I don't remember who it was, said to me that they thought that Biden would not make it through the uh, Democratic Convention. That seems pretty severe, but it's a, uh, pretty late to make a change in, in, yeah, in that situation. That, that's pure speculation. It is. And uh, and there's also arguments made that you do not want to raise the subject of replacing Joe Biden at the convention. Mm-hmm. It would fracture the party, and at that stage uh, on the election process, you'd not be able to mend it. So but they it, feel that if it's going to happen, right. it would Biden have to before stick, then. Yeah, but, and Biden has to initiate the action, and from all indications, he doesn't plan to do so. And talk a little bit about what not getting through the um, the convention means. Does it mean not coming out as the nominee? Okay, okay. That's essentially what this person meant. This.